Well, I suppose what's happened is it's a strange situation, isn't it? You've got the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition both trying to quell um, backbench revolts against, against their leadership um, and being pushed to do things that they don't really want to do. So Theresa May has said, you know, we won't delay. We're going out on March, at the end of March. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So it looks like she's going to say this afternoon, well, maybe we'll push it back a little bit. And Corbyn, you know, definitely no second vote, don't want another referendum, and now saying, well, maybe we do want a second referendum. Now, I notice your title is Financial Economics, but can I just yeah. add into that uh, politics, political and financial economics? Because what we seem to have in the United Kingdom at the moment now is a first-past-the-post system with at least four parties. I think we need, we need to say it's nearer six or seven parties, or eight parties, if you put in Plaid Crimea as well. Maybe. But you've got a, within the Conservative and Labour, you've got two very, very different factions. You've got TIG, you've got the Lib Dems, you've got SNP. Are we destined now to have fragmentation and political um, opacity, uh, lack of decision making because of the way the system is designed now? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that it will play out quite like that because um, the, because of first past the post, there's an enormous uh, tension between, on the one hand, it looking like there's fragmentation, but on the other hand, the voting system meaning that the two big parties, and, and they may have people splitting away from them, but nonetheless, when it comes to the election, the two big parties almost certainly taking the vast majority of the seats in Parliament. So despite, as you rightly say, tensions which are looking like we're going to get multiple parties and a new party emerging in the middle, when you come to a general election, the history of the UK is actually you end up with 90, 95% of the seats going to the two big parties. But isn't that the seeds of more discontent and more policy paralysis? The fact that it's being typified now as a hard left versus a harder right, plus this wishy-washy bell curve of everyone else in the yeah. middle and what have you. And yet no one seems to be able to make a, a decision either in opposition, there's no cohesion in the shadow cabinet, in cabinet, more importantly, where you don't have dis collective decision-making anymore. Well, I think that the hard right thing about the Conservative Party is, is strange in a way, because if you look at the economic policies of the current Conservative Party, they're lukewarm about capitalism. Yeah. Theresa May has made many statements that look kind of left of centre-ish. They haven't got uh, a strategy of dramatically shrinking the size of the state. I mean, there's nothing hard right about the economic policies. The hard right label is really about Brexit and that part of the Conservative Party that wants a hard Brexit. Once the Brexit thing is out of the way, I mean, and that may take a, a couple of years, but let's suppose it's out of the way by the time of the next general election. I don't think you any longer have a hard right mm. Conservative Party. You may well have a hard right, sorry, hard left Labour Party. That depends on whether Corbyn survives. I think. I'll make you right, David, yeah. Uh, David, can I ask you about how the markets are behaving around this? Because um, this morning we're trying to explain why the pound has been firming against yeah. both the dollar and the euro uh, and I've posited the idea that this is actually about a Corbyn government being taken off the table now we've got this splinter group rather than a view on Brexit per se I wonder what your, your read on this would be yes I, I think I think there's a, there's a lot going on um, every day there's a little bit of news about the position of Corbyn and how many Labour MPs might break away and I think a reasonable judgment is that relative to where we were a week or two ago, the probability of Corbyn being Prime Minister is lower than it was. And it wouldn't be surprising if that, if that were the case, I think it is, if um, sterling was worth a bit more, maybe UK stocks were worth a bit more. So I think that's def definitely part of the story. I think there's then you factor on top of that the Brexit thing, and it looks, to me anyway, rather significantly less likely this morning that at the end of March there's going to be a hard exit than it did uh, a couple of days ago. I think both of those things are going on there. Yeah. And why, why are gilt yields tracking the Bund effectively when one might have thought that the market would price in greater risk about owning the gilt than the Bund at this yeah. stage? I mean, gilt, gilts are extraordinary. In some ways, gilt yields have been extraordinary for some time. I mean, to, to my mind, the most extraordinary fact about the price of UK government debt is the following. That Index link guilt yields, the guaranteed real return you get if you buy a UK government bond, have been negative for a long time and are now substantially negative. So that if you buy a 10-year UK government bond, you're buying something which guarantees to give you a negative return of about minus 1.7% every year. So after 10 years, you're guaranteeing that you've lost in real terms 
something like 30%. So every pound you invest, you get back 70p. I mean, that's extraordinary when government debt has exploded over the last 10 years mm. and the UK is on, on negative watch for being downgraded. I mean, that's extraordinary. Hi, I'm Joanna Bersetti and thank you for watching. You can check out more of our videos by clicking on the boxes on the screen. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more from CNBC International. Thank you for watching.